continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but uh, sometimes when like I'll open up a news page or you know social media, and I'll look at the caption or what, like the headline of, of the article, and I see it says something about like Christians. There's like a tinge of me that is like, uh-oh. Like, what, what, what is happening? What did, what did they do, right? There, there's an element for me that says, oh, the article says, a group of Christians showed up to protest this. And I go, uh-oh, what did they protest? Right? Or, or a group of, uh, or evangelical leader says or did, and I go, uh-oh. And, and part of me gets really, really nervous because um, as I click the link, I don't know how the, the folks who say they are following Jesus, they're, they're like, in the name of Christ, I'm doing this thing, or I'm living in this way, I, I get nervous because I, I've seen lots of, uh, uh, you know, I have lots of options to pick from that maybe go, ooh, that might not have been the best action or the best thing to say in that moment. And sure, you could argue that, well, the mainstream media is just biased towards Christians, and therefore they're going to hand-select the worst. Yeah, I mean, okay, sure, I, mean, I guess you could make that, selection, uh, make that uh, uh, argument. But part of me thinks that if there are folks who are behaving outwardly, like knowing that they're the outside world, the, the, the world outside of the walls of the church are looking at those who say, yes, Jesus is my savior, I check that box. If they live in this way and they do these things, I think there's an element that perhaps it's because for those of us who say we follow Jesus and that have opened up our Bibles, maybe sit in pews every single Sunday and have, uh, are choosing to live in a certain way but are, are, are doing these things and living in a way that seems contradictory to how we might read the Bible, it makes me think that maybe there's an element that we don't know how we're supposed to live in light of the fact that there are people out there who don't know Jesus and are looking at us and seeing us at work and in the marketplace and seeing us in our neighborhoods or at our classes in our school. And, you know, I, I think I, I get a sense of that because I, th I think that a lot of times, all people, certainly not just Christians, we don't have the market cornered, but all people go into the world driven by our own sense of right and wrong and not what God calls us to. Right? We're more driven by our politics or our feelings than Jesus. And I think that's the, the, the thing that creates this equation that comes up with this result of people living in ways that seem contradictory to how God might want us to actually live. And so what should a Christian's life outside of the church actually look like? You know, who are you and I, those of us who follow Jesus, supposed to be when we leave these pews, when we leave these seats, when we go out this ornate-looking building and go out there and live and, and, you know, interact with those around us. When the worship music stops and the sermons end and the benedictions have been received, what is it that we are called to bring out into the world? And so as we prepare uh, for... Uh, as we uh, prepare for, for landing on this sermon, um, what we're going to he hear is that Paul is going to talk to the Colossians, the, at the Colossian church, and what God has in terms for them, in terms of how they are to live, and I think that God is speaking to us today still through it, and that we can see how we are to relate to the world around us 
We've already read the passage. So, uh, you know, I think the framework here is uh, in a, a sermon like this, if you kind of break it down, it's really, really simple to just go, okay, verse 2 says this. Continue steadfastly in prayer, prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So let's do what that thing says. Let's pray. I'm going to pray one more time, and then we're going to scrape a little bit deeper into this text so we can see really what God is calling us to. So let's pray. God, as we listen to this verse that tells us to continue steadfastly in prayer, God, we know that prayer is important. And so, God, help us to approach the throne with the right mindset, with the right mentality. And, God, let us have hearts that are ready and willing and able to confess the ways that we have not represented you well. And confess even, maybe even on, on behalf of other people that maybe we should have spoke up against or we should have spoke in challenge or we should have spoke and been a loving voice in the ear of folks who maybe didn't do things that, really brought your name glory. God, we pray that this word would speak to us as we do get ready to go back to work tomorrow or for those of us who are in school, go back to school uh, very, very soon. And God, I pray that as those who follow you go into the schools, go into our workplaces, that we would indeed bring much light to those places. And not for our glory, but for yours alone. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, uh, you know, like I, like I start off, when you see verses like that, it says, hey, pray continuously. It's really easy to fill in the blanks and say, okay, like, I get it. If you, this is your first time in a church ever, even if it's like in, like in a building, you probably can, can guess that Christians care about prayer. Like, you could uh, go to a VBS growing up or a KSA here, and they probably talked about prayer. Right? We, we know that there's the Lord's Prayer. And so it's really easy to go, okay, well, it's talking about prayer. It's, it's, it's something that's really, really important. And, okay, so verse 2 says, continue steadfastly in prayer. And it's really easy to go, okay, here's another sermon that just says we need to pray more. Right? It, it, and then some of us can feel that guilt. You know, we go, oh, you're right. You're right. I do need to pray more. My faith is not big enough. I'm putting too much in my own hands. And, th- yeah, that could be true. Right? Or some of the, like, we, we even struggle, like, for those of us who say grace before meals, we were, like, like halfway to the food, like, oh, uh, dear God, thank you for this food, in Jesus' name, pray, and then you eat. So, like, prayer is this thing that we can, we know a lot about. A lot of us, sometimes, we can feel guilt about it, that we're not doing enough. And if I just land here at this verse, just go, okay, yeah, I, I need to pray more. Uh, actually, I think what we see here, it, calls, it gives a, a more nuanced thought in terms of it, and that's why we need the whole passage here. And we'll read uh, verse 2 again, but really just the first section of verse 3. I actually helps set the frame. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us. And so what is he saying? What is Paul, the, the writer of this, saying? He says, we all need prayer. Yes, you need prayer. Yes, you, maybe we should all pray more. Okay, okay, for sure. But Paul, who is the leader, he's a leader in this, the ministry. He's recognized as such. And he's saying, yeah, you need prayer, but I need prayer as the leader. And it sounds familiar. I was like, yeah, everyone, everyone needs to pray. It doesn't matter. You're high on the hierarchy, low on the hierarchy. You, you, we all need prayer. But it's actually really quite countercultural, even in our American, modern, Christian, like, sensibility and context. Because I think if you are, are on Instagram and once you get past, like, if you're a parent, the parenting Instagram or, you're, you know, you're into fitness and you scroll past the fitness ones or whatever, and you get to, like, a Christian Instagram, like, the pastor, you get a clip. There's, like, a 15-second clip of a pastor. And the clips that we usually get are the pastor that's, uh, like, slamming on, his, on, on uh, the, the pulpit. You need to do this. How good is God? Like this, this, this big, it's a big show. It's a big, loud call to action for you to go do something. But what Paul here, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, what is he saying? He's saying, if he, if he was on TikTok, if you were on Instagram, he'd be screaming, "Pray for us! We need your prayers!" 
I don't know if I, I really see that on social media necessarily. I don't feel like I see Christian leaders crying out for their congregations to be praying for them. And so in asking for prayer, he's telling his congregation that I am not better than you. I need you to pray for me like I have been praying for you. It tells them that we are united in Christ. He never stops having that pastoral leader role. He's still the leader. He's still the Apostle Paul. That doesn't go away. He's not discounting that. That's still there. But in asking for, for prayer, he exemplifies and expresses a deep need for mutual obligation of prayer partnership. He, he did not only a good reminder and a mo- of our model for our church, it also amplifies the ultimate truth that no matter what you and I do, God is the one that's in control of all of it. And so whether you stand up here and you're preaching a sermon with a, in an ornate uh, uh, pulpit with a giant Bible, or you're quietly working in the lab by yourself, or you're studying in the library with a study group, whatever you do, God is the one who controls all of it. And so pastors, ministers, leaders, we don't have the market cornered in the church with the direct, most direct connection to God. We all need prayer. And I love that Paul in this passage says, I need your prayer. Pray at the same time. Pray also for us. Pray so that God would move, so that God would respond. Pray that God would do. These are all the things that the leaders are praying for. We can't do anything without God. We may think we, are in ultimate, like we have ultimate control. But at the end of the day, we don't have the final say in life. In, at the end of the day, in all of life, we need God to open up doors for us. We need God to create the opportunities for us in all of life. So then the question that pops in my mind as I was studying this is, well, what does Paul ask for prayer about? Right? It, 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 he, this, the framework is there. He's like, listen, can, keep praying. Keep praying. You need to pray more. That's important. But pray also for me so that God Pray that God would do something. Pray that God would open up these doors, give these opportunities. Well, what are the opportunities that he's talking about here? And so I think that's what, you know, the, the, if, as we read it, we know that it says Paul's in prison, right? Like that's the context, the situation in which Paul is writing. And, and those circumstances were difficult. Like being in prison is, is difficult from my understanding. Uh, and, and, and if you think for anything, He'd be like, pray that God would open the prison doors. Give me the opportunity to get out of here. Why? So that I can go and preach the gospel, so that I can go and activate the church. Like, that would be like a good prayer, right? That's what seems like be the most important thing in Paul's mind. God, crack open the door so that I can go out and bring your name great glory. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he asked God to open doors for the word. Paul does not pray for circumstantial change. He prays for gospel opportunities. Let's read it again. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. I think that we miss this a lot. I've, been in a, a, <laughs> I've sat in countless small groups over the years in which I was, I was in ministry. Uh, lots of student small groups, lots of uh, adult small groups. And when it comes to prayer time, I would say the majority of them when we're sharing prayer requests, it's about God, would God change my circumstance? 
There's a circumstance at work that I want God to change. There's a circumstance at home that I want God to change. There's a circumstance at school that I want to change. There's a circumstance in my body that I want God to change. There's all these things, these circumstances that we ask God to change. Or we go, God, I don't know what the situation is, but God, would you make the circumstance positive? Would you make the outcome of that a good thing? Would you make that happy? Would you make that joyful? Would you make that good? And now, don't, don't get me wrong. Like, that's important to do. Like, don't not do that. Like, that's, I'm not saying you're a sinner if you ask God for, like, help for you to, you know, help at work or help at school. That's good. And we should do those things. Uh, but after reading this passage, I can't help but feel like, how different would our church be? How different would our faith journeys be if instead of asking for prayer about our circumstances, we prayed for opportunities. Opportunities to declare the mystery of Christ, to embody and proclaim God's love to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying don't pray for your circumstances. Do do that. Like, that's important. We should. But if our primary prayer life centers around changing our circumstances and little else, it makes me wonder of our thought process when it comes to coming to church. Uh, recently, I guess, I, yeah, yeah, recently. Recently I was on a trip uh, in, uh, to New Hampshire. And, um, you know, if you've ever driven to New Hampshire, sometimes you've got, like, long stretches, like, where you're driving for, for a little bit of time. Uh, and then sometimes when you, like, hit, like, a city center or, or a town center, it's like, oh, like, all of a sudden it kind of, you kind of notice things. You kind of notice, oh, that's a church building. And for one, uh, a lot of times when I'm, I, I used to drive to New Hampshire, like New, New Hampshire and Maine, like twice a year, every single winter and every single summer for like church retreats and stuff. So I've seen a lot of churches on my way up uh, to, to the final destination for the retreat center. Um, but there was this one church that stuck out to me recently uh, because of the sign out front. And, and church signs are one of those things that are, they're kind of funny. Like sometimes it can be informational, like church potluck. Next Tuesday, don't put apples in your potato salad, Greta. Like, like don't, like, those little things. Or they, sometimes they try, uh, try to be cheeky. It's like, you know, follow Jesus, and I don't mean Twitter, or I guess now, like, X or whatever. You know, I'm never going to call it X. Um, you know, like, the, sometimes we, the church signs will, will have these, like, funny little things. But what was interesting about this church was it wasn't, it wasn't like the ones that you can swap out the letters. It was a permanent sign affixed over the door. Like, as you walk in. And so the, the church sign said this. It said, enter to worship, exit to serve. Enter to worship, exit to serve. And so I have to ask us, my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, why do we go to church? Yes, it is to worship God. I love coming here. I love worshiping with you guys. It, it is an amazing thing. I love hearing the word. That's important. It's good to do. We, yes, we should 100% go to church to worship. But I think this passage shows us that we need to look beyond church services and church buildings. Yes, our, our faith must have this vertical focus on God, like 100%. That's the beginning of it, definitely. And, and that's why prayer is necessary. But it also needs to have an outward vision. And I think we see this in the passage, right? At the same time, pray also for us that God may open doors to us, a door, uh, sorry, open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. This is a call that God would open doors for us to focus beyond the church beyond the program, beyond the services. And there are plenty of passages that talk about building up the church and worshiping God the right way, plenty of them. And so, again, not saying that those are not important, but this passage here is focused beyond the church walls. And this agrees with other parts of Scripture. James 2.18 says, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. We both need well, we need both faith and works. We need to worship God, yes. We need to grow in our faith, yes. But our faith should lead to action. 
And a key space where we should do that is serving those outside of church, outside of the faith. Those who don't know Jesus, those who do not understand the mystery of Christ, as this passage says, outsiders. We must walk in wisdom towards them. And if faith produces works and you can't have one without the other, then what are we building up every single Sunday if we don't ask God for opportunities to live out and share the good news, the thing that we're hearing here every time we crack open a Bible and we're listening to a preacher share and call us to live differently, to that there's life change, that the, the gospel is good news. If we're not thinking, I need to share this with other people out there, then what exactly are we doing? So let's recap. We should all be praying. Check. Right? And we shouldn't be praying just for circumstantial change, but we should be praying for opportunities to exemplify God's love and the good news of Christ to outsiders. Sounds good, right? But Paul goes one step further, and, and I, I really love this. Not only does he ask for opportunities, but he asks that he would utilize the opportunities given to us, that he, they would make the most of them. Let's see this here. I'm going to read the, the three to six all the way through. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. If we break it down to an incredibly simple concept, it's this. Life is nothing more than a collection of opportunities. Say that one more time. Life is nothing more than a collection of opportunities. From one moment to the next, we move from opportunity to opportunity. One chance to do good or bad to the next. And what this passage is telling us is that Paul asks that they would be effective, that he would be effective with the opportunities that he has. And so, I love that asking God for opportunities to utilize them. He, he asks us that, let me be great, right? He says, in the, in, the, in the way that I ought to speak, the opportunities that I have to speak with my speech, with how I live my life, and maybe always be seasoned with salt. Let me know how to answer people's questions well. And so with every opportunity, let me be amazing. Let me be spectacular, God. With, with every opportunity that I have, let me be superior. Let me be all the adjectives that they use to describe Spider-Man. Like, like, let me just, just those things with the opportunities that I would be so good, so incredible. I want to note a couple things here, though. Paul speaks a lot about speech, and given the context, it would seem like he's talking about evangelism. Right, like going and sharing the good news in the, like that, that evangelistic way, right? Um, and, and in our direct sharing of the good news that Jesus died for our sins, we should be clear and wise and gracious with, and having the right answers. And, and for, yeah, I agree. That, that's, that's, that's certainly in the Bible. That's certainly here. But at the comment, one of the commentaries that I read, it pointed out this also in, includes all the things we say not just when we share the gospel. So it's not just when you have like a tract in your hand or you're sending your friend a YouTube video or, or something like that. It's not just in the evangelistic action. It's in everything that you say. One commentary put it like this. Paul envisages, envisages a church expected to hold its own in the social setting of marketplace, baths, and meal table and to win attention by the attractiveness of its life and speech. God does not want his people to flee from society, to be afraid of the world, to hate it. God wants his people to live lives that are so attractive and so positive for outsiders and for, so that they, they can taste how good that life is. He uses it seasoned with salt that it literally 
you can just get the flavor of how good, how savory that life is. In verse 6, uh, like, oh, I already said that. He, he talks about that seasoned salt, but it's not just about an attractive life that's like, oh, well, how, how good are my kids at sports, right? Or how amazing was my Instagram photos from vacation? Right? It's not that sort of attractive, right? It's not, look at, my, look at my resume, look at my CV, look how impressive I am. Oh, and I also happen to be a Christian. No, actually what it's saying is that God wants his people to live in a way that attracts outsiders not to us, not to the, the, the lifestyle, not, not to our clothes, not to our outfits, not to our tech. No, but to him. And it, it, it brings the people who are outside, the outsiders, those who do not follow Jesus, it brings them to the point that goes, listen, I don't understand why you do this. I don't understand how you do this. but I'm grateful you do. I'm thankful that you are my employee. I'm thankful that you're my supervisor. I'm thankful that you're my neighbor. I'm thankful that you're my classmate. Because I don't, I don't understand who this whole Jesus thing is, whatever, but man, I love how you live. It's different. It's different. So yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you go on, with your, your, what are you doing on Sunday? Okay, that's fine, that's cool. But man, I can't wait to work with you again on Monday. And so, do you want to live that type of life? I hope so. I want to live that type of life. Because I think that's what the type of life that this passage points us to. And so if you're there, if you're there and you say, yeah, I, I, let, 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 let's, let's live that type of life. So now there's one more thing I want to say before we wrap up. There's this. Uh, I did youth ministry for years. Uh, youth ministry is a fun uh, space because a lot of like weird things happen. Not good weird things. Like uh, you learn a lot about how they speak. But one of the things for me that I found over the, the course of time, which I did youth ministry, is like a lot. We had these like weird traditions that just popped up over time, just because just th things are funnier and less serious in, in youth ministry. Uh, one thing, for instance, was. Uh, there was, a, a, there was a week that we were supposed to have our regular scheduled program on a Friday night. Um, but uh, I became hospitalized. Later, later on, uh, I realized uh, I had a kidney stone. Uh, it was painful. It was horrible. Um, but basically, uh, I messaged my, uh, my team and said, hey, look, guys, like, I'm in, I don't think I messaged them in the hospital because I was in too much pain. But I think when I, when I got back uh, home and I was like, guys, I'm not going to be able to make, I'm on like painkillers. I'm going to be like loopy. Like the, the students will be all confused. So we, we're going to have to like, I don't know what to do, guys. But I, I, most of the time I'm, I'm just whatever. So I, I leave it up to you. I said, if you guys want, go do like a game night. And so that's what they went with. And, and um, so we did a game night. And so uh, as, a, as like a joke the following year, um, I'm spending way too much time on this. Uh, the, the following year, I said, hey, guys, it's, it's that same weekend again. Let's, let's commemorate my kidney stone, and we're going to call it kidney stone night. Uh, and so basically, it's a game night, but, you know, we just put a little dressing on it, and it's like, hey, guys. And so, like, it was, oh, my gosh, I'm spending way too much time. Uh, we're like, hey, everyone, bring your water bottle because you need to stay hydrated to avoid kidney stones. Anyway, um, that's one example of just the silly things that we do. But... That, that's totally unrelated, and I've spent too much time, and I apologize. But one of the things that we do do, one of the things that, we do, that is relevant to this is, uh, over the course of time in, in my ministry, um, whenever I finished anything, whether I finished like, sharing a message or whether I did an announcement, I would look out into to the, the seats of where all my students were, and they would all be like this. And it's like, oh, and, and guys, remember to do blah, 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 blah. And then they would all look at me, and they'd have their hands up like this. And you be like, what, what, what is happening? Are they getting ready to pray? No, no. We, we, I don't know when it started or how it started, but there, we have this tradition that says, when I'm done with anything, I would go, and break. And we'd clap. And so then everyone would just I'd say, and break, and then everyone would clap. Um, and it's just a weird tradition, and I, I thought it was really, really funny. But it, it, it's, it was cool because it, like, it united us, uh, and, and it made us like, you know, part of one group. We had traditions, right? It was cool. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, oh, actually, you know what? This is a really apt response. 
Because when you do and break, if you've never played like sports before, you've never played like football, like that, that, that's usually what you do at the end of the huddle. So if, in football, it's usually the quarterback, they get the play from the coach, and the, the quarterback gives you the play. Here's the play. We're going to run this, we're going to pass, we're going to do whatever. And now that every, you guys all on set, okay, and break, clap. And then the, everyone would go, line up on the line, get ready to execute the play that they received. And I thought this is a cool analogy for how every single Sunday should go. When someone is up here sharing God's word with us, that's the play. When we share about what God is doing, who God is, what he's calling us to do, that's the play. And as we hear it, and as you understand, yep, I understand. And then the line is out there. And as we walk out those doors, we need to be like, ready? Oh, and break. We're going to go out, execute the play, have answers, live life that's drawing people to God. And so... I hope that you guys, every single Sunday, every single time you open up your, the word, every single time you have a conversation with a fellow brother and sister in Christ, that you hear the play that God is calling you to do. So that not that you just keep it inside here, that your best is only in this space, but that some of the best of you is also out there for those who don't know, who haven't heard the good news who do not understand the mysteries of Christ. And I hope that when you walk out those doors, you're ready to execute and play well. And it's because of Jesus that we can even do that. Because if we're on our own, you ever see, you ever see like Pop Warner football? It is adorable. But execution-wise, is a mess. You got kids run, lining up on the wrong side. You know, they're, they're, they think it's a run play, it's a pass play. It, it is just not great. And without Christ, that's what it's like when we're doing that. That's why Paul centers this really on him. And that's why, we, that's why every single Sunday we commemorate the Lord's Supper. And that's why we, we come and we say, yes, we need to be reminded that we are one, united in him, in his death and resurrection. And so, we're, like, like I said, we, we, we commune here every single, every single week. And I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to invite the worship team and the, those who are serving communion to come up um, while I pray. Let's pray. God, Heavenly Father, it's hard to ask for that level of efficiency that every opportunity, every uh, chance that we get, that we would be seasoned with salt, that it would be attractive to the world outside. And God, that, but that's why it's not about us. It's not about how well we prepare. It's not about our, our willpower, our abilities. It's about you. And God, would we just be mirrors that are reflecting your love to the world out there? Would we just be mirrors that reflect your goodness to the world out there? God, we thank you that you died a, an unrighteous death and that it was accepted and that you were raised again so that we could be changed, that the Holy Spirit could dwell within us so that when we do step outside of these walls, step into our workplaces and our schools and our neighborhoods, that we can do a, even a fraction of this. And so God, I pray that this would stay with us as we prepare to take the elements, as we prepare to go outside. And we thank you that you hear our prayers. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.